Let's now look at a situation that the book goes through because this is really um, helpful in understanding the situation. This is the idea of now having a downhill race between four different objects where each object has the same mass and they're on the same incline, right? So they start a height h up, we've defined the length of this, um, and you have some theta. Now, they all roll without slipping. And the question is, which of these four objects get to the bottom first? Now, you might quickly say, well, it's the same, why does it matter? And if you think that way, then the problem is that you're using the particle model. So if we approximate all of these objects as particles, it's true that they would all get to the bottom at the same time. But when we use the rigid object model, we actually care about the size and shape of these. This one is defined to be a particle. And in that case, we now need to think about rotation of them. This one, the particle, doesn't rotate because it's a particle. It doesn't have any mass other than what is located at radius equals zero. But these others have a moment of inertia, they have rotation, and that's going to actually change how they roll downhill. So let's think through this. The book actually goes through the math, and I just want to th have you understand conceptually what's going on. We can think about this as a conservation of energy problem. The gravitational potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. So our system includes our objects and the gravity from the Earth. We don't worry about any dissipation, like due to friction or air resistance. So simple, our initial energy is potential energy. Our final energy will be kinetic energy. However, we now have kinetic energy as a sum of rotational and translational kinetic energies, right? So if we basically get to say that our change in potential, oops, wrong symbol, plus the change in kinetic is equal to zero, and this is u final minus u initial plus k final, min that's not a minus, minus k initial equals zero. In this case I'm going to define this as y equals zero and so I get to say that this is oh, not that one. Sorry, this is equal to m g h final is equal to zero. k final is what I'm trying to find and they start from rest so this is equal to zero. So what we then have, let me move over to the side, is that minus m g h equals minus k final or m g h equals k final. So mathematically that's what this statement says. But now we say that okay k final is equal to one half rotational which was i omega squared plus translational one half m v c m squared. Now there is a fixed relationship between these two and that was again this idea that the rotational speed over, um, oops, that's, the rotational speed times r equals vcm. So we can actually rewrite this as one half i and I'm going to actually try to rewrite this in terms of vcm so that's vcm over r squared plus one half m vcm squared. So why do we care? vcm is going to be the velocity that it has at the bottom and this is the center of mass velocity. So not the rotational motion but just the linear motion. But we see now that this is going to depend on i. So what's, well, what's complicated about this is that this whole sum is equal to mgh, where mg and h are the same for each of these three particles. Note that in order for that to be true, we're assuming that radius is much, much smaller than h, so we don't have to worry about the height that the center of mass is located at. So in our old model, where we didn't worry about rotation, we would say that all of these objects would have the same speed at the bottom, since they have the same uh, mass, for instance. But now we see that it depends on i. 
that the bigger I is, the smaller that VCM must be. So that's the logic here. The larger the value of I is, the smaller VCM must be. Not only because these two are multiplied, but because you have an additional VCM term here. So the bigger this term is overall, the smaller this term must be. So what that means, VCM is going to relate to the acceleration that this experiences on the ramp. So again, we had learned back in chapter two that objects on an inclined plane all would have the same acceleration, but that was only true for the particle model. So now they all have the same length over which they're accelerating. They have different velocities at the end, which means the accelerations they experience on this ramp are actually different. And this is one of the rare cases that we're talking about acceleration and thinking about energy, but thinking about how its motion is changing on the ramp is easiest to do in terms of acceleration. So the objects with the largest moment of inertia will have the smallest final speed, which means they have the smallest acceleration. So the book uses the idea that we can express the moment of inertia for each of these particles as some constant C times the mass times the radius squared. And that's true. Remember that moment of inertia is always going to be some numerical factor times m times r squared. For a particle, it doesn't have a moment of inertia. All of the mass is located at the center. So c is equal to zero. That's the smallest. And in this case, we define the acceleration that it has on the ramp to just be itself. That's the winning acceleration, the most that you can have. This is like old fashioned chapter two stuff. This you know how to do. So then, in second place comes the sphere, and the numerical coefficient for the moment of inertia there is two-fifths. The book then sets up an equation for how you can calculate the acceleration, and again, see the book if you want to work through the math. But notice that the sphere has, again, the next smallest moment of inertia, because this is two-fifths, the solid cylinder is one-half, and the circular hoop is one. So this has less acceleration than the particle, but it's the biggest of these three. The circular hoop, which has the largest moment of inertia, has the smallest acceleration. And again, that means that if we used conservation of energy, we see that the circular hoop has the smallest center of mass speed when it gets to the bottom, and that's how you could calculate what the acceleration is. So the point is here to realize how much rotation can actually impact some of the physics that we've previously been studying. And that's part of why it's been important up till now to realize that you're using the particle model and now to differentiate or distinguish going forwards whether you want to use the particle model where you don't need to consider rotation at all or if you actually can't use the particle model, do you need to consider the rotation of your object? And if you do, that can that can change something as simple as the acceleration on an inclined plane.